So in the process of sharing the faith, there are objections that people will raise, and they'll say you can't trust in Jesus because the Bible's nonsense. That's really the issue, isn't it? It, it, it would be uh, surprising to me if a lot of people said, yes, I understand the Bible, I believe it, I just don't want anything to do with God. There are some people that, that feel that way. But for the most part, they've been convinced that the Bible's nonsense because of science. And it's so ironic because science is a tool by which we, we try to understand the systematic way that God upholds his creation. Science is, is theistic in its, uh, in its basic presuppositions. And so as an astronomer, I, I think it's a shame. I, I just very much enjoy science and seeing how God upholds his magnificent creation. What a shame that science, a tool that God has given us to glorify him has been perverted and used for the exact opposite purpose. What a shame. And in my own field of astronomy, I'm convinced that astronomy, study of the heavens, the study of the stars, uh, confirms biblical creation. It confirms what the Bible teaches. And so we're gonna take a look this evening and see how the secrets of the cosmos confirm the Bible. And I think you'll find these very helpful when you have, when you have conversations with people who have had the misconception that the Bible is somehow un, unscientific. People will say, well, the Bible's not a science textbook. And that's true, because science textbooks change every few years when we realize we didn't get some things right. We make new discoveries. There'll never be a Bible 2.0 because God got it right the first time. He does understand how the universe works. And so when the Bible touches on science, it's right. And the Bible does touch on science. It touches on astronomy. And so that's what I wanna look at this evening. I wanna show you how the secrets of the cosmos confirm the Bible, and there are five secrets of the cosmos that we're gonna take a look at this evening. We're gonna see how the glory of God is revealed in creation, just as the Bible teaches. The Bible got that exactly right. We're gonna see that the Bible is right when it deals with the basics of astronomy, things you would learn in a freshman level astronomy class, very basic uh, astronomical truths. The Bible got those right as well. We're gonna see the Bible is right when it, when it touches on the age of the universe, and we're gonna see that the scientific evidence confirms that, the Bible got that right. The Bible is right when it speaks about the uniqueness of Earth. Earth really is a very special planet where God placed those creatures that he made in his own image. And we'll see the Bible is right about that as well. And then we'll talk about distant starlight and how God might have got the light from those galaxies to the Earth. And can that be done in a biblical time scale? Well, yes, of course it can. God did it that way. And we'll see how science actually confirms that. So the Bible got that right as well. And so the theme to take home is the Bible got it right, as it would have to, as the Word of God. So let's dive right in. We'll see how the glory of the Lord is revealed in creation. Uh, this, and, and there are a number of ways in which the universe declares God's glory, but the Bible tells us it does. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And that, again, is that beautiful uh, Hebrew poetry where you say something and then you say it in a, different, in a different way. So there's something about the universe. When we look at it, it speaks of God's glory, not literally, obviously, but in terms of uh, we recognize the handiwork of God when we look into the heavens. And there are a number of ways in which the universe does that, but I'm just gonna focus in on two for the sake of time. I'm gonna argue that the size of the universe and the beauty of the universe are consistent with the mind of God, not chance. I think it's uh, easier to believe if you're the sort of person who believes the universe is, is by chance, it's just an accident, it's probably easier to believe that if you don't know much about it. The more you know about the universe, the more you recognize it as the handiwork of God. It is beautiful. It's not an accident. It is stunning artwork, and we're gonna see some of those this evening. And then, of course, it's immensely big. God made a universe that is just beyond our ability to comprehend. I can't, I'm an astrophysicist. I can't comprehend the size of the universe. I can, give, I can give numbers in terms of how far we, we've been able to probe so far, but even those numbers, we use exponential notation and so on because you can't really grasp it. But nonetheless, I can build up certain things and compare them to other things and give you kind of a feel for just how amazing this creation is that the Lord has placed us in. We're gonna start with the moon. It, the moon has its own beauty to it. It's uh, one of the astronauts who walked on its surface called it a magnificent desolation, and it is. It's got a beauty to it, but it's a desolate kind of beauty. It doesn't have the, uh, the features that, that uh, Earth has, but it is beautiful, and it's fun to look at through a small telescope, backyard telescope. This is a mosaic image of the moon where they've taken lots of very high-resolution images and stitched them together, and sometimes the brightness doesn't quite match. That's why that's the case. This was taken with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. We have a spacecraft orbiting the moon and taking very high-resolution images of the surface. 
And I, again, I love looking at the moon through a small telescope. I love showing it to others through a small telescope because they look at it and they say, wow, that's, that's impressive. It's, it, it has a beauty to it. And then sometimes they'll, they'll ask, well, Dr. Lau, can you see the, f- the flag, the flag that the astronauts planted? Well, no, you, no. Uh, this is, the moon's about the size of the United States, so you're not gonna see something that small on its surface uh, when you consider how big it is. Uh, again, smaller than the Earth, though, and 240,000 miles away. I mean, that's pretty far, but we can kind of get a grasp of that. Some of you might have a car that has 240,000 miles on it, if you've got a really good one, right? And uh, so, you, 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 theoretically, you could have driven that, that distance. Over, over a long period of time, you could, have make, you could have made it. The astronauts, they were traveling at the speed of a bullet, and they took three days to get there, just to give you a feel for it. Now, we can't see the flag, but it's interesting, we, because of that lunar reconnaissance orbiter, it's, it's so high resolution, it actually can. It actually can see the, the places where the astronauts landed. And so if we zoom in here on Mare Tranquilitatis, which is where the Apollo 11 uh, spacecraft landed, we can see what's left of the, the lander there. Isn't that fascinating? And remember when, they, uh, when the astronauts landed using that, that, uh, the LEM, the Lunar Excavation Module, that spider-like looking structure, they left the bottom of it and just launched the top portion to save fuel. And so the bottom portion is still there. And you can see the lunar module right there and some equipment that they left on the surface. And that dark streak going over from the lunar module to over to that crater, uh, that's the footprints of the astronauts. And so it's kind of interesting. They're, they're 40-year-old footprints, and uh, they're not going anywhere. The moon is rather dusty, and it doesn't get any maid service. So it's gonna, they're, they're going to remain there for a very long time. There's no weather on the moon. There's no wind or anything. So footprints stay footprints for a long time. So that's absolutely amazing, I think, that we can see that, that sort of thing. The scale of the cosmos is as amazing as its beauty. So here's the moon, and let's compare it in size to the Earth. There you go. So you say, well, yeah, we got, the, we got the long end of the stick on that one. Pretty big. Earth's pretty big. And it is, until you compare it to something like Saturn. Saturn's nine Earths across. That's just the planet. The rings extend out even further into space. The rings are trillions of tiny little moonlets that orbit around Saturn. So you say, wow, Saturn's pretty amazing. It's pretty big. And it is, until you compare it to the sun. The sun is 100 Earths across. And it's basically a stable hydrogen bomb, a very efficient power source, fusing hydrogen into helium that releases an enormous amount of energy. Sun gives off more energy in one second than a billion major cities could use in an entire year. And if that seems wasteful, you need to remember God has unlimited power. And of course, the sun is just one star. Yes, those little tiny pinpricks you see in the night sky, those are the same type of objects as the sun is. The sun is a star. It's a main sequence star. Main sequence means that uh, it obeys a rule that if you know the mass of the star, you basically know everything else about it. You know how big it is, how hot it is, how bright it is, the surface uh, uh, color, which is determined by temperature. And the sun obeys that rule, and most stars do, and then there are some that are unusual. They're a little bigger, like giants and supergiants. Main sequence stars that are less massive than the sun are smaller and redder. They're called the red dwarf stars, and they're very numerous. They're all over the universe, but you don't see them very easily because they're not very bright. They don't show up very well. Some of the stars that are more impressive, though, are quite a bit bigger than the sun, like Mintaka. This is one of the stars of Orion's belt that you see in the winter skies. And so, again, just, just keep in mind the, the scale of things. So we got the Earth. The Earth's one one-hundredth the width of the sun. You could line up 100 Earths across the sun. And this star, you can see, it's quite a bit bigger than the sun, isn't it? You could line up a number of suns across its surface, but there are stars bigger than Mintaka, like uh, Canopus, for example, which uh, you probably can't see that from Nebraska. You'd have to travel a little way south because it's, uh, it's close to the Earth's, uh, it's in the southern hemisphere sky. But you can see it's a white supergiant. Look how, look how tiny the sun is compared to Canopus. It's remarkable. And there are stars bigger than Canopus, like, for example, Antares. Yeah, pretty amazing. You could line up 600 suns across Antares. Amazing. And 100 suns or 100 Earths across the sun. So you multiply that out, and Antares is really big, really big. And of course, there, there are things bigger than that, but that's about as big as stars get. But stars come in clusters sometimes. Some stars are kind of single, like the sun. Some come in binary pairs or triple pairs. And then some, you have these massive clusters. Of, there's probably 100,000 stars in that cluster. Isn't that beautiful? And by the way, you can see these in a backyard telescope. You just gotta know where to look. And, uh, and they're, they're all over the summer sky. It's really, uh, really quite stunning. It reminds me of the passage that we just uh, heard just a few minutes ago, that God calls them all by their names. God has a name for each one of those stars. Isn't that amazing? 
100, and, and we, can't even, we can't even count that many. We think there's maybe 100,000 there, but we can't, it's not like anybody sat and counted them. We just estimated it. So um, fun to look at, beautiful. Some of my favorite objects, though, in the universe are not stars at all, they're nebulae. Uh, from the Latin meaning cloud, a nebula is a cloud, not of va water vapor like an Earth's atmosphere, but a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. That's the same stuff stars are made of. They're made of hydrogen and helium gas, but their gra the, uh, the gravity of a star keeps it in a spherical shape, whereas the nebula is so spread out, the gravity is minuscule. And so if you have stars nearby, they'll heat up that gas and cause it to glow, and you get the most beautiful and vivid colors in some of these things. They're, they're wonderful to, uh, to photograph. You can see a lot of these with the small telescope, although the, you really can't bring out the color because at night you're using primarily your rods, which are not color sensitive. So it looks kind of like a grayscale version of that, but it's still beautiful. And so uh, when you get those stars nearby, it'll heat up the gas, make it glow. Sometimes you'll, it'll reflect off the gas, you get a reflection nebula. Sometimes you get a star cluster and a nebula right next to each other. There's a star cluster down there. And so that's always a, a neat thing when that happens, when they're lined up that way. But the, the point is, this thing is huge, and to the point that our solar system wouldn't really show up on this image. It's that big. Some, some nebulae are enormous. Some are relatively small. They're only about the size of the solar system. It's about as small as they get. And, and these are called planetary nebulae. Some of them are round and look like an out-of-focus planet. And so you hear, here you have a planetary uh, a nebula. There's a star in the middle. In all planetary nebulae, there's a star in the middle. And it's um, ejecting gas. And sometimes they have kind of a two-lobe structure. We think the star is ejecting gas along the axis of the poles, the north and south pole of the star, because it's, it's spinning. And, uh, and so this is dynamic. It's not only artwork of God, it, it changes over time a little bit, over the centuries, as these, as these uh, gas clouds expand away from that central star. All kinds of planetary nebulae out there. Some of them are uh, bipolar, some of them are round. And it could be the ones that are round are also bipolar, but maybe we're looking right down the barrel. That's a possibility. We don't know because we can't get another angle on it. So there's still a lot of surprises left for us in the universe. One of my favorites is the Ring Nebula. And it does look kind of like a ring. And it's one of the first that I learned how to find. You can see this in a small backyard telescope not too far away from the star Vega on a clear summer night. And it looks just like that, or rather a grayscale version of that. It, it looks like a little glowing smoke ring. And it's so strange because, you know, most places you point a telescope, you see stars and stars and stars, and they're beautiful. But they're stars. There's one little magic spot where you will see a glowing smoke ring. And it's so strange to see this little cosmic Cheerio suspended on nothing there in space, just uh, hanging there. You're expecting it to expand like smoke does on the Earth. And, of course, it is expanding. It's just enormous. And so you don't notice the expansion uh, you know, unless over, over maybe centuries you would. So there's a, the little stars in the middle. The stars collapsed in on itself. It's a white dwarf now. It's no longer fusing hydrogen. So all of these structures that we've looked at, these, these planets and stars and nebulae and star clusters are part of a much larger structure, which we call a galaxy. And so a galaxy looks something like that. And so we live in a structure something like that about two-thirds of the way out. Uh, our galaxy is similar to this in that it's spiral, it's disc-shaped, and we live in between a couple of the spiral arms there. Uh, stunningly beautiful. So what you're seeing here is a collection of about 100 billion stars, so many that it's hard to pick out any individual star. And it wasn't until the uh, 20th century that people realized what these were. We could see them even in the 1700s. You could see these structures, but they thought maybe they were nebulae, clouds of gas, because they couldn't see individual stars. And then finally, in the uh, early 20th century, the technology had developed to the point where we could see individual stars for the first time in these, in these galaxies, and that proved that they are, in fact, very far away, much farther than we had realized. And, and suddenly, we realized the universe is much bigger than we previously thought, because there's not just one galaxy out there. There are billions, hundreds of billions, in fact. There are all kinds of galaxies. Galaxies of tremendous beauty. There are galaxies of tremendous ugliness. Yeah. <laughs> There are galaxies that have large, mysterious arrows next to them. <laughs> You'll find that in all the textbooks. There are galaxies that have rings of stars surrounding them. There are galaxies that look like flying saucers. That is a real galaxy. That's the sombrero. You can see that in a small telescope. That's part of the Virgo supercluster, visible in the spring sky, if you know where to look. And, and you can even see that dark dust lane in front of it, because galaxies have not only stars, but they have gas and dust. And the dust tends to be focused along the equator if it's a spiral galaxy. And that's what you see. Isn't that lovely? 
Absolutely beautiful. There are galaxies in the process of collision. That's interesting. And people say, is that, is that a problem? Galaxies colliding like that? Not for us. <laughs> Actually, the stars would all miss each other because the, the stars are tiny compared to the distance between them. It'd be like you know, throwing a sand grain at another sand grain and hoping they collide. It'd be almost impossible. The stars will pass harmlessly past each other. Here we have a cluster of galaxies. So every, every one of those little fuzzy spots you see there, that's not, a, that's not a star. That's a galaxy with perhaps 100 billion stars each. Isn't that amazing? That's just one little section of the sky. We pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at a, at a relatively empty region of the sky, a region we thought was relatively empty, and did a time exposure image of it, and we found that that out at these tremendous distances are galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Each, every one of those little things that you see there is a galaxy. Even the ones that are just tiny, they're just at, at tremendous distances from us. And so each one of those things might have 100 billion stars in it. And you extrapolate that and you figure, well, if that's typical, then that means the visible universe has probably at least 100 billion galaxies, one for every star in our own. And so that's amazing. And if you think about that, all of that was spoken into existence by the Creator, by God. He spoke and they stood fast. That's power right there. And I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. It's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. <laughs> God has a delightful sense of humor. And astronomy is quite a lesson in perspective because Genesis, we read the Genesis account because it's written for us, it's written for human beings, it focuses primarily on the earth, but it does tell us that on day four, God made everything else. God spends five of the creation days working the earth, making it right for life for, the, for those creatures that he made in his own image. He takes one day, day four, and says, you know what would go really good with an earth? How about 100 billion galaxies? And he speaks those into existence too. And again, I don't, you know, people say, why would he make it so big? Why would he make all those hundreds of billions of galaxies? They're probably not necessary for life. But then again, God has unlimited power. And if that's what he's trying to demonstrate here, he's succeeded. Think about the energy of all those stars. Remember, the sun gives off more energy in a second than a billion cities could use in a year. And there's hundreds of billions of stars just in our galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies. That's a lot of energy, isn't it? You can't wrap your mind around that. You can just say, wow, praise God. So the Bible is right when it says that the universe declares God's glory. The universe is not an accident. It's, not, it's, it's a wonderfully designed piece of art, really, that's, that's functional. What about the basics of astronomy, though? Things that you would learn in any freshman-level astronomy class. The interesting thing is... The Bible not only gets those right, but there were times when people disagreed and now they'd have to admit the Bible got it right. Uh, let me give you an example of this. The spherical nature of the earth. The Bible indicates that the world is round. Indicates that in a number of places. I think the best example is uh, Job 26.10, which says that God inscribes a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And, uh, and the waters would be the earth's, you know, that would be the oceans. And that circle is what we call the terminator, where light stops or terminates, and it's always a circle because the earth is spherical. That's the only way you can get that. And so it makes sense. The, the earth is indeed round. Now, that's interesting because the, um, these passages, Job was written 2000 BC, we think. That's our best estimate of it. And yet, if you look in most textbooks, most, most astronomy textbooks credit Pythagoras with being the first person to realize that the earth might be round. And Aristotle is usually considered the first person to prove that the world is round from evidence like shadows, on, shadows of the earth on the moon during a lunar eclipse and things of that nature. And uh, that's, that's right and it's insightful. But my point is the Bible had it right long before the secular scientists of the day figured it out. Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if the Hebrews had some kind of divine insight into this issue. How did they know that? Well, they did have divine insight into the issue. Oh, by the way, the idea that Christopher Columbus was the first to come up with the idea the earth might be round and was out to prove it, that's a myth. Educated people knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. He just thought it'd be faster to go that way. That was the, 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 the disputed point. And he was wrong, by the way. And he didn't realize the Americas existed. So, But I'm glad he made the trip. <laughs> 
The earth is suspended in space. The Bible describes God hanging the earth upon nothing in Job 26, 7. We might think of God uh, sort of um, uh, anthropomorphically hanging the earth like a Christmas tree ornament, and yet he hangs it on nothing, and it floats in space. And that's a great description of the nature of gravity. God literally hangs the earth upon nothing. Might have been hard to believe when it was written, though, because the, the early Greek uh, scientists and the early Babylonians, they all taught that the earth was a flat disk and floated in water. And wouldn't that make more sense? Because things float in, we've seen things float in water, at least some things float in water. That makes sense. That's, that's tangible. We can see that. But have you ever seen anything hang on nothing? That might have been hard to believe, except the Bible's exactly right. Again, at a time when it was not commonly believed. Expansion of the universe. The Bible teaches that God stretches out the heavens as a curtain, spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, indicating that the universe apparently is bigger now than when God first created it. It was somewhat smaller then. And, uh, and that's something that might be hard to believe even today if you just look at it. I mean, you go outside tonight or on a clear night, you look outside and you look at the stars and you go out the next night, it looks like it's about the same size. It doesn't look like it's been stretched out. And yet that's what the Bible teaches. It wasn't until the 1920s, 1920s, that astronomers like Edwin Hubble, who measuring um, redshifts of galaxies, realized that all the galaxies seem to be moving away from all the other galaxies, as if the entire universe is getting bigger, being stretched out. Isn't that interesting? Just what the Bible taught uh, all along. And again, it, it, look at the time difference there between when God had revealed this information and when, when secular scientists finally stumbled upon it. It's thousands of years later. And really, the only way you could discover this by scientific means is with uh, in modern instruments. Think you need a telescope, you need a spectroscope in order to measure red strips, and those weren't invented until recently. So it's kind of it, neat. To me, this is confirmation that the Bible really is divinely inspired. It's, it, this is information only God could know until modern times. Oh, by the way, I have to, I have to mention, too, because some people think, well, does this mean, a, this mean there, there was a big bang, right? Because... If all the galaxies are moving away from each other, does that mean that if you run the movie backwards, they were all in one place at one time and they kind of exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago? The answer is no. Just because something's getting bigger doesn't mean it exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Some of you are getting bigger. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago. It just means you're a little bigger now than you used to be. It happens to all of us. So in any case, and, and people, it, so apparently God made the universe with size, and then he stretched it out since then. It was never in a point. That doesn't make any sense, really. Uh, people have said, well, does this at least count as a successful prediction of the Big Bang? Because didn't the Big Bang predict that the universe would be expanding, and lo and behold, there it is? And the answer is no. The, the Big Bang idea that uh, Lipmater came up with, uh, the idea that the universe sprang from a point that, that sort of rapidly expanded, that was invented in 1931. The expansion of the universe was discovered in the 1920s, and Lemaitre knew about it. He was trying to come up with a naturalistic explanation for that expansion. And although he did believe in God, he, he tried to separate God from science. He, was, he, wasn't, uh, he didn't think that God really had anything to do with nature other than maybe starting it. So, no, it's not a successful prediction of the Big Bang. It is a successful prediction of the Bible, if you will, because the Bible gave us this information long before it was discovered by scientific means. Conservation of energy and mass. This was a little more abstract, but I think the Bible teaches this. The conservation of uh, energy is the idea that energy can't be created or destroyed. We, at least we can't. Uh, you, can, you, can only be, you can transform it from one kind to another, but if you, you, know, if you put a certain amount of information into a, into a box, a, a box that's uh, isolated and doesn't, it doesn't um, allow energy in or out, you open it up later, you'll have the same amount of energy you started with. Energy can't be created or destroyed. Mass is the same way. Mass, the amount, it's kind of how heavy something is, it's resistance to motion. Uh, that uh, can't be changed. You can push mass from one place to another. Mass and energy really are the same way, the same substance, according to Einstein, they're just measured different ways. And the Bible teaches this principle because the Bible teaches us that all things were made by God and that God ended his work on the seventh day. And that tells me that no new material is gonna pop into existence because that would mean that, that God is still creating, which cannot be because he ended his work by the seventh day, or it would mean that something can come into existence apart from God, which cannot be because all things were made by him. You see, so it's, uh, nothing new's gonna pop into existence and nothing's gonna cease to exist, at least in terms of the, the material, because God upholds all things 
by the word of his power, and by him all things consist or hold together. So we would expect nothing's just gonna you know, fade away, fade away into nothing. Now God allows things to change and he allows things to, de to deteriorate, but the amount of stuff in the universe is constant. Now does this preclude a creative miracle? Of course not, God can do what he wants. These are general trends by virtue of the fact that God isn't creating anymore and he is upholding that which he created. These two principles together are conservation of energy or conservation of mass. And it's hard to pin down when uh, secular scientists came to accept these principles, but usually James Joel is credited with the discovery of conservation of energy, at least. Uh, he's 1800s. And by the way, he was a Bible believer. He was motivated by scripture, and he wrote about that. He said, basically, uh, that when he, when he dis discovered by scientific means the principle of conservation of energy, he pointed out that that makes sense in light of what the Bible teaches. So good, good science can be motivated by scripture and often is. Uncountable numbers of stars. The Bible teaches that Abraham's descendants would be as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, a metaphor for a humanly uncountable number, a simile for a, a humanly uncountable number, right? Because you can't, you can't count the number of stars, right? That's a pretty good analogy, isn't it? That's a very good analogy. But it might have been hard to believe when it was written because the number of stars you can see Naked eye, we estimate to be somewhere between 3,000 or if you have really good vision, 10,000. And that's a big number, but that's countable. You could count to 10,000. It would be tedious, but you could do it. And so you'd say, well, you know, Lord, is that really such a great uh, analogy? Sand on the seashore, yeah, that's uncountable. But stars of heaven, if there's only 10,000, that's a problem, isn't it? And then in uh, 1608, this wonderful instrument was invented called a telescope. And uh, Galileo in 1610 had his own, and he pointed up at the Milky Way and found that that cloudy band in our night sky just looks like a nebula is actually hundreds of billions of stars. So modern astronomy confirms that stars are humanly uncountable. You cannot count to 100 billion in your lifetime. You don't have the time to do it, not, neither the, nor the motivation, I might point out. But in any case, uh, the Bible's right all along. Very interesting. And so my question is, do you get the point? Have we learned the lesson of history? Have we learned that in the past, whenever the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right? We've seen examples of that. The Bible's right about the roundness of the earth, the earth floating in space, the expansion of the universe, conservation of energy, uncountable numbers of stars. All things that you would learn in any freshman level astronomy class, the Bible's right about all of them. And yet, there was a time when secularists disagreed with every one of those principles. Isn't that interesting? They have egg on their face today. They were wrong. God was right. Have we learned that lesson today? I hope you have. Not everyone has, though, because I gotta tell you, today there are a lot of people that think they're smarter than the God of the Bible. And they think, well, the Bible got this wrong. And so what I wanted to do is show you some areas where uh, the, the secular science or the mainstream science of today has not caught up yet with scripture. And one of those is regarding the age of the universe. But what I wanna show you is that the evidence is consistent nonetheless with what the Bible teaches. The actual science confirms the Bible. It's only the opinions of some scientists that is contrary to the Bible. But opinions are not evidence. The Bible is right about the age of the universe. There are many lines of evidence that confirm the universe is thousands of years old. And we, we covered this this morning, the fact that God created in six days, and it's clear from context, those are ordinary days, approximately 24 hour days, solar days, we call them today. And uh, it, human beings are made on the sixth day, that was a few thousand years ago. Uh, the, most of the objects in the universe were made on day four, right, because that was when God made the sun, the moon, the stars also. The Hebrew word for star is kolkab, it would include planets as well, so Saturn was made on day four. Um, and so that, that tells me that the universe is not billions of years old, at least in terms of the objects within it. It can't be, at least from the perspective of Earth. And that's a problem because people think that there's all this evidence for billions of years. Really, there isn't. And, and I wanna show you that, in fact, the evidence lines up with the biblical time scale. One of those lines of evidence is the excess internal heat of the giant planets. Jupiter, for example, gives off twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. So it takes in one unit of energy from the sun and gives away two. It takes in one unit, gives away two. It's kind of like the federal government, right? It spends a lot more than it takes in, and it can't do that forever. Because if you think about it, that means it's constantly losing energy. If you're giving more than you're taking in, you're losing energy, right? And because uh, it, it's radiating it to space. So what happens is Jupiter eventually has to cool off. And the problem is, if it's really 4.5 billion years old, as the secularists believe, why hasn't it cooled off by now? Why is it still so warm in its interior? Why does it have that internal heat? 
You can think of it kind of like a, a potato that you've just heated up in a microwave and you bring it out, and you can feel the heat coming off of it, can't you? Now, if you come back two hours later, can you feel the heat coming off of it? Well, no, because it's radiated all that heat away into space. It's giving away the heat faster than it can take it in. Now, Jupiter is a much bigger potato, and so it can do that for a few thousand years, and it's not a problem. But if it's billions of years old, why is it still so warm? The problem's even worse for Neptune, which gives off about 2.6 times as much energy as it receives from the sun. And it's a smaller planet. It's only four Earths across, whereas Jupiter's 10 Earths across. So you'd wonder, how can, how can an object like that maintain all that internal heat? It's a problem in the secular view. By the way, the Earth does that too, but at least with the Earth, they say, well, maybe radioactivity on Earth can generate that heat. But the outer planets don't have radioactive elements in any uh, sufficient quantity at all. They're, they're primarily hydrogen and helium gas, which is not radioactive. Magnetic fields. You might know the Earth has a magnetic field that causes your compass to work. A lot of cars have them these days, and a uh, co compass built right in. And that magnetic field is caused by electrical current in Earth's core. You got an electrical current going, and that creates a magnetic field. The magnetic field acts like a shield. It protects us from charged particles that come from the sun or from other stars. And so it's actually a, a design feature. But because it's electrical current, uh, electrical current runs down over time. Batteries run down. And the Earth's magnetic field is decaying. And we've been able to measure that over the centuries. And sure enough, the magnetic field has been decaying in, in the century and a half that we've been able to measure. It appears to be an exponential decay. So it means it was, you know, it kind of, the rate decreases as it, as it, as it peters out. Uh, we think, by the way, during the flood year, the magnetic field was disturbed and rapidly reversed due to the plate tectonics. But that's neither here nor there. The energy of the magnetic field has simply been dropping since creation. We figure based on its current half-life, the magnetic field was 20 times stronger at creation. That'd be nice, because you'd have increased protection from cosmic rays. You wouldn't have as many mutations. That would have a health benefit. Uh, but in any case, the point is, if you run it back much more than 6,000 years, you get problems. If you run it back 60,000 years, 60,000, then the magnetic field following that equation would be stronger than that of a neutron star, which is enough to rip the atoms of your body apart. So obviously it couldn't have had that, it couldn't be that strong and therefore the Earth can't be that old. And we're not talking even millions of years, we're talking 60,000. And so it's, it's just ridiculous to think that the Earth's millions, let alone billions of years old, the magnetic field will be gone by now. And my secular colleagues say, well, there's some kind of recharging mechanism, but there, there really isn't evidence for that. As far as we can tell, it's a free decay, which is what we'd expect from first principles of physics. And it's not just the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, some of the other planets of the solar system have magnetic fields as well. Some don't, Venus doesn't, but, but Jupiter has an enormous magnetic field. It'd be bigger than the sun if you could see it. It's actually too strong for life. It would be a problem if uh, we were to get too close to Jupiter. It could induce currents in us and so on. So it's a... Um, it's, it, but why is it still so strong, given that magnets naturally decay over time? Magnetic fields decay with strength, with, with, with time. They decay in, ter in terms of their internal energy. And so it's consistent if it's a few thousand years old, but it's a big problem if it's billions of years old. The uh, magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune. Here's, here's the planet Uranus, and Uranus rotates on its side, so it rolls around the sun, kind of, and... Uh, it's got a magnetic field on it. That was, some, that was shocking to secularists when Voyager 2 flew past Uranus and also Neptune and found that they had magnetic fields because given the size of these planets and the assumption that they're 4.5 billion years old, the magnetic field should be gone. But it's not, it's still there. In fact, a friend of mine, Dr. Russ Humphreys, uh, who's a creation physicist, calculated what the magnetic field strength of the planet Uranus should be given its biblical age of 6,000 years. He, his prediction was right. And you can look in the literature and confirm it. He made the prediction in 1984, two years before Voyager 2 flew past it and confirmed his prediction. So you see how real science starts with the Bible if you want to get the right answer. He was also right about Neptune, by the way. And his, um, his, his model, which is really interesting, um, actually explains the magnetic field of all the planets very consistently. But it's interesting because we didn't know the magnetic fields for Uranus and Neptune when he came up with this model. So it was a prediction and a very successful prediction. Now my secular colleagues say, well, there's some kind of recharging mechanism, which they call a magnetic dynamo. And they say that somehow recharges the magnetic fields of the planets like Uranus and Neptune. But one of the requirements of that model is that the magnetic field needs to be lined up with the rotation axis which for Earth it kind of does, it's a little bit off, but for Uranus it's not even close. You can see the magnetic field is at a very different angle to the rotation axis, so the magnetic field would wobble as the planet rotates. So. And uh, 
And Neptune's is similar. Neptune's is also off the rotation axis. So it seems like it's, it's just evidence that they're not billions of years old, or even millions, really. The recession of the moon. The moon is actually moving away from the Earth due to tidal forces. Did you know that? The moon moves about an inch and a half away from the Earth every year. It gets a little bit further away. And that's not a, that's not a huge distance considering it's 240,000 miles away. What's an inch and a half every year, right? And uh, it, the, the cause of that is tidal forces. The moon induces tides on the Earth. You probably knew that because yeah, of the moon's gravity. It squeezes the Earth a little bit, causes tidal bulges. The tidal bulges get ahead of the moon because the Earth rotates faster than the moon orbits. And the, tid the gravity from the tidal bulges pulls forward on the moon. And when you pull forward on something in orbit, it moves out. I know that's a little counterintuitive, but if you've ever played with a gyroscope, you know that when things are spinning, they don't always obey your intuition. You push a gyroscope that way, it goes that way. It's the same way, something in orbit uh, when the astronauts in, on the space station want to go into a higher orbit, they thrust forward, and that moves them up. And so that's why the moon is moving away from the Earth at an inch and a half a year. It's, it's draining a little bit of the Earth's energy to do that. But the Earth has a lot of energy to spare. And so if you run the movie backwards, at creation, the moon would have been about 730 feet closer to Earth, something like that. But the problem is, if you run it back much further than that, and you have to do, by the way, you have to do the math right here, because... The, is if the moon's closer, the tidal bulges would be bigger. And so the rate of recession would be larger. It's not constant at one and a half inches per year. That changes. And so it would be much more. Be, pretty soon it's several feet per year, and pretty soon it's miles per year, and so on. And uh, you do the math right, you find at 1.4 to 1.5 billion years in a hypothetical past, the Earth and moon would have been in the same place at the same time, which obviously cannot be, right? I mean, they can't. And even before that would happen, they'd tread each other due to tidal forces anyway. But uh, that's an upper limit, you see, you can't, because you can't have less distance than no distance, right? That's a maximum age of 1.4 billion years, and that might sound like a lot, 1.4 billion years, but that's an upper limit, and yet the secular assigned age of the Earth and Moon are 4.5 billion years. You see the problem? Because 4.5 is greater than 1.4, right? Even the common core folks would get that one, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, comets. Comets are made up of icy material which can last no longer than 100,000 years. Comets have elliptical paths. They go far away from the sun and they get close and then they whiplash back out. When they're far away, the ice remains frozen. When they get close, that icy material is heated up by solar energy and it, it causes the material to be blasted away from the nucleus of the comet. And that's what, that's what a comet is. You're seeing the comet's tail. That's material that's being blasted away from the nucleus by solar energy. And we know, the, we know how much material's there. A comet nucleus is only a few miles across. It's a, it's a ball of ice, ice and dirt. And, and um, we, we can measure the rate at which the material's being depleted, and that gives you a maximum age of a typical comet, and it's something like 100,000 years. And so if the solar system's 6,000 years old, we should still have comets, and we do. If the solar system's millions of years old, let alone billions, comets should be all gone by now. They should have run out of material a long time ago. So why do we still have comets? And so that's an indication of the youth of the solar system. Again, my secular colleagues are aware of this. They can do the same math I can do. But they say, well, there must be a comet generator that makes new comets then. And so that's the idea of the Oort cloud. Have you ever heard of an Oort cloud because of the inventor, uh, Jan Oort, who came up with the idea that maybe there's this vast supply of potential comets out beyond the farthest planets. And every now and then one of them is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. But they're so far away we can't see any of them. And uh, of course, it's, it's hard to disprove something that's undetectable, so I can't disprove that, but I would argue that there's no logical reason to believe in something uh, like an Oort cloud. It just, uh, it just makes more sense to believe that comets are young. We don't need that rescuing device. Spiral galaxies are an indication of the youth of the universe. Spiral galaxies rotate differentially, which means the inner portions rotate faster than the outer portions, as indicated by the arrows, in terms of their angular velocity. A star that's nearby, the, that's, that's nearer to the core, will, will make a trip in less time than a star that's farther away. Uh, it takes them a longer period. And if you think about what that means, that spiral structure would have to twist tighter and tighter over time, wouldn't it? Right, because the, the inner portion's twisting greater than the outer portion. And so if these galaxies were really 10 billion years old, as the secularists believe, you would not see spiral structure at all. It would be twisted so tight, it would be like a uniform disk. You'd just see um, you know, traces of, it would almost look like an old-fashioned phonograph record in terms of the tightness of the spiral. I actually ran a computer simulation to see how long it takes 
to become twisted beyond recognition. It doesn't, it, it's far less than 10 billion years. After even 100 million years of, of revolution, we see it's so tightly wrapped that no galaxy in the universe would look like that. They all look like this, they all look young. It's kind of interesting because, you know, people will say, well, if, if Dr. Lyle, if the universe is young, why does it look so old? And I'm thinking, I don't know what universe you're looking at, but the, the, all the galaxies I've seen look young, all of them. I have, I have yet to see one that's extremely tightly twisted that way. Uh, by the way, it's not just the galaxy itself, but the stars within it. You might notice that the spiral arms have a bluish tinge to them. That's true. That's because they have a higher proportion of blue stars. And blue stars are a big problem for the secular view because they don't last very long. Blue stars are the brightest, most luminous, uh, energetic stars in the universe. They have, they, now they tend to be the most massive as well, but they, and so they have a lot of fuel available, but they use that fuel up at an alarming rate. You've heard the old adage, you know, the candle that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. Well, these are very, very bright candles, and uh, so they don't last billions of years. And, 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 and by the way, that's not even disputed. Secularists will agree that you, you cannot have blue stars lasting uh, you know, many millions, let alone billions of years. Uh, there's just no way around that. And so they would say, well, new ones must have formed recently somehow and uh, by you know, a cloud collapsing, a nebula collapsing in on itself. But the problem is nebulae, uh, the, the gravity of a nebula, which is the only thing that can pull it together, is very meager. Gas pressure in a nebula is normally much greater than the force of gravity. So they're not, gas isn't gonna just collapse in on itself spontaneously. Lots of problems with uh, the idea of star formation. Maybe you've heard, maybe you've read in a newspaper, all, you know, astronomers have seen a star forming region. I got news for you, that's fiction. Astronomers have never seen a star form. And I don't think there's any evidence for it. I'm not adamantly against it. Stars are not complex organisms, you know, but nonetheless, uh, I don't think there's good evidence that stars uh, f are forming today. I haven't seen any anyway. No one's seen one. No one's seen a star form or in the process of formation. So again, the evidence would appear to line up with what the Bible teaches in terms of the biblical time scale. And so those people who capitulate to the millions of years are not doing so for scientific reasons. Uh, perhaps for psychological reasons, but not for logical reasons. The uniqueness of the earth is another issue where my secular colleagues would sort of disagree with scripture, an issue that's not really relevant to the age of things, but nonetheless, science confirms that earth is unique. And we'd expect that given what the Bible says about the earth, because the earth is different qualitatively from the other planets in the universe, because it's designed for life. Isaiah 45:10. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. So God made the earth for the purpose of housing life. And as such, the earth has some unique features on it that make life possible. Large amounts of liquid water, an oxygen atmosphere. Uh, it's the right distance from the sun so that water remains in a liquid state, so we neither burn up nor do we freeze, and so on. It's got all these life features, a magnetic field that protects us from cosmic rays, and so on. And if you think about it, the Earth is actually four days older than any other planet, because Earth's made on day one, according to the Genesis account, and yet all the other objects in the universe are made on day four. So the Earth really is unique, it's special, and it's designed for life. Uh, Earth's neighbors, not so much. We have the moon, for example, the moon, our next door neighbor in space, a magnificent desolation, as one of the astronauts who walked on its surface called it, but it's not designed for life. Even the astronauts who walked on the moon, they had to take a little bit of earth with them, right? A little bit of air from the earth, a little bit of water from the earth, a little bit of food from the earth, because the moon has none of those things. And you couldn't survive there apart from an environment that you, that you apart from bringing a little bit of earth with you. It's not designed for life. It has a beauty to it, no doubt. I'm glad God made it. And it, and it serves, it, it helps life on earth actually, because it stirs up the, the tides and keeps the oceans from stagnating and so on. But it's not designed for life itself. It's not designed for life on its surface. Earth's neighbors, you got Venus on the left, a bit closer to the sun, Mars on the right, a bit further away from the sun than Earth is. What about those, are they designed for life? Well, some people thought maybe so. There were some secularists that thought maybe Venus might have all kinds of exotic life uh, on its surface and they were free to speculate because it's permanently enshrouded in clouds. You can never see the surface of Venus, so sure, yeah, why not? All kinds of, why not put all kinds of imaginary life on its surface? And then, then, of course, they measured the surface temperature and found it to be 900 degrees Fahrenheit, so you're not gonna have life on Venus. Although, by the way, there's no humidity, so it is a dry heat, for whatever that's worth. 
but uh, it's not a place you want to go on your next vacation. And those, those um, clouds are made of sulfuric acid type compounds. So you just, it's just nasty. It's not a place to visit. Uh, Mars is a little better. Mars would kill you slower because it's a little more hospitable, but not much more. It doesn't have the right atmosphere. Again, you'd have to bring some Earth with you if people ever, I don't know if, that'll, if it'll ever happen, but if people will ever visit Mars, they'd have to bring a bit of Earth with them because Mars doesn't have the right kind of atmosphere. It's got an uh, atmosphere of carb, very thin carbon dioxide. It doesn't have liquid water on its surface. It does have the water molecule in the form of ice and in the form of water vapor. There's some in the atmosphere, but not liquid water, and the conditions aren't right for liquid water, so that might be an issue. It doesn't have a global magnetic field like the Earth does, so you wouldn't have the protection from cosmic rays that the Earth has. Not designed for life. And, and, it's, and it's bitter cold. You think it's cold in Nebraska? Try Mars. Very cold. So it's interesting. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You got these planets too hot, that one too cold, that one just right. We'd expect that on the basis of what the Bible teaches. And that, that brings up the question then, what about uh, extraterrestrial life? And all granted, the Bible doesn't directly say one way or the other, but I would not expect to find intelligent life out in space. I think programs like SETI are just really a waste of uh, money because we're not going to find intelligent life in space because the earth was formed to be inhabited. And these other worlds that God made are to be for signs, seasons, days, and years. They're, to, you know, they're for our benefit. They're not to house life. And if you do believe in life in space, then you've got some the theological problems, right? If you've got you know, Vulcans and Klingons out there, uh, they can't be saved because they're not related to Jesus. It's because we're all of one blood, the Bible says in Acts 17. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He's related to us. That's why his blood uh, can atone for our sins, because his blood is our blood in that sense. He's our, he's our brother. We're related to him. But Lieutenant Worf is out of luck because he has, he's not related to Jesus, and so you see he can't be saved. And so that's why I really don't expect to find uh, life out in space. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, the, one of the motivations for wanting to find life out in space by the secularists is because it would vindicate evolution, or at least it would, it would lead toward it, right? Because in their view, the Earth's just another planet, just one where the chemistry happened to be right, and wherever chemistry is right, life evolves. And it, hey, it's a big universe, so probably life probably evolved elsewhere too. And so why not? But then, of course, they got a problem is why don't we see any? called the Fermi Paradox, Enrico Fermi, a very brilliant scientist, actually, part of the Manhattan Project, and he was known for being able to do quick calculations in his head. But at one point, he burst out, where are they? He figured if, if there were, you know, it's a big universe. If evolution happened on Earth, probably happened elsewhere. And so it probably happened elsewhere earlier than it did on Earth, in which case some species would already be space-faring, and, and they should have colonized the galaxy by now, but they haven't. So where are they? And I would suggest that they're not there. They're not there because uh, God didn't make the universe for that purpose. As much as I enjoy science fiction, I really do. But that's not the reason God made the universe. It's to be for signs, seasons, days, and years, and certainly to declare his glory. What about the distant starlight problem? I want to spend some time on that. And, and it, I want to show you it's really not a problem for a young universe at all, a universe that's young according to the, the, the scriptural time scale of a few thousand years, which is not really young, right? Because People don't even reach 1,000 years anymore, and we say they're old. So the universe is maybe 6,000 years old. It's old, but it's not as old as the secularists teach. But there, here's the, the problem in the minds of people. They think, well, light from distant galaxies uh, ought to take billions of years to reach the Earth, because we know what the speed of light is. It's very fast, but the galaxies are really, really far away. They're even farther away than light is fast, if you will, and so you'd think it would take billions of years for the light to get from those galaxies to the Earth, but obviously the light has got here because we see them. So, make, so therefore, the universe has to be at least billions of years old, the light travel time problem or the distant starlight problem. There have been a number of proposed solutions to this. I do have to pr quickly point out, though, that, that people have proposed a lot of solutions that don't work and I, I do this just by way of uh, protecting myself because otherwise people will come out, well, Dr. Lyle, have you thought about this? Yes, we've thought about that. It doesn't work. There's a reason. Uh, for example, the idea that, well, maybe the, maybe the universe just isn't that big. Maybe the stars are actually very small and very close. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just not feasible. There are good scientific um, methods by which we establish the distances to these stars. They're not based on evolutionary assumptions or anything like that. Sometimes you have to be careful because not everything in an astronomy textbook is based on actual evidence. Sometimes it's based on conjecture or the need to believe in an evolutionary origin. 
But no, the distances are real, and, and, and there are good methods that, you can, uh, that we've established that with. I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Uh, one conjecture that was tried, and I'm, I'm glad they tried it, was the idea that maybe the speed of light was faster in the past. And that's a neat idea, because sometimes that's the solution to things. Sometimes the secularists will have an inflated estimated age because they've assumed that a rate is constant when really it isn't. Really, it was faster in the past. Uh, but we think this isn't the answer for starlight, though, because there's good evidence that the speed of light has always been what it is uh, today, at least the round-trip speed of light, which we'll talk about momentarily. That's actually related to other things in nature, like the, the relationship between energy and mass is set by the speed of light, so we don't want to tamper with that. Uh, one idea is that maybe the light was created in transit. After all, Adam was made as an adult, and, and so was Eve. That's true. They didn't need any time to grow. Maybe God, when he made the stars, he made the light beams connecting them to the earth. And that's kind of a neat idea, but I think there's a problem with that. The light in transit idea means that God would have created fictional images and movies of things that never happened. And let me show you what I mean by this. In the year 1987, we saw a star blow itself to bits. In the, uh, it's one of, in one of the Magellanic Clouds. It's a satellite galaxy to ours. It's 100 and, I think it's 170,000 light years away, something like that. 170,000 light years. Now, a light year is one light year is six trillion miles, but in, in the standard thinking, it takes light one year to travel that distance, which is why it's called a light year. And so in, in, in the standard secular view, this event actually happened 170,000 years ago, and the light of it finally arrived in 1987. So the, the star that's indicated on the left there by the arrow, that's the star that blew itself to bits. The, the image on the right is the explosion. Today, it looks like this. You can still see the material from the star expanding away from that center. Now, if you say, the, 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 so the question I'm gonna ask is how do, we, how do we see this in the biblical universe? And if you say, well, actually the way that we see it is God created the beam of light, then what that means is that star never actually existed because it's beyond 6,000 light years, which means God had been creating a light beam 6,000 light years long with pictures of explosion, an explosion that never happened sequentially, like a little fictional movie that God's been feeding us for thousands of years of a star that never existed. And I've got a problem with that. It's not that God lacks the power to do something like that. He, God can do what he wants. He's got unlimited power. But I don't think it's consistent with his nature to do something like that because he's not the author of confusion. So if the light in transit idea is true, then none of these things have actually existed. They're simply pictures that God put in beams of light. And I don't think that's reasonable. Some of you might say, I don't know, I think maybe God would create pictures and beams of light. Be careful because how do you know I'm even here right now? You say, well, I see you. Well, that's because God's creating a picture of me an inch away from your eye, but I'm not really even here. Well, we, we hear you, Dr. Lyle. That's because God's creating the sound an inch away from your You see, it, re, it removes us from reality if we think that God's gonna give us uh, fictional images and so on. Now, sometimes we misinterpret what we see. That's our fault, not God's. But God's not gonna go, gonna go out of his way to make pictures of things that didn't actually happen. I don't think that's realistic. Uh, it's been proposed that gravitational time dilation is the answer to distant starlight. I don't think this is right either, but I wanted to mention it in case you've heard of this. Uh, Einstein has shown us that time can flow at different rates depending on certain circumstances, and that is a true principle. Uh, but this doesn't solve the starlight problem because the effect is very meager. It's only like a 2% effect, so it's not enough to get starlight here in 6,000 years. I'm gonna give you what I think the answer is, and it's, it's, and it's a little bit, um, it's gonna require you to think a little bit because it's not, uh, it is simple, but it's, it's, it involves physics that most people haven't, had in, in high school or anything like that. The solution, I think, involves the one-way speed of light. And the speed of light, which is abbreviated by the lowercase c, is 186,282 miles per second. That's how far it travels in one second. It's very fast, very fast. But that is a round-trip average speed. What do I mean by that? I mean that that is the speed we measure for light if we, if we send it on a closed path and measure the total time and divide by the total distance. Let me show you how this works. Let's suppose that we build a very long hallway. We'll make it 186,282 miles long to make the math easy for the Common Core folks, right? We'll pretend we have government funding. We can waste it on this long hallway. And uh, we'll put a mirror at one end of it, okay? And then I'm gonna stand at the other end of it. I'm gonna stand over here with a flashlight and a stopwatch or a clock, and let's say a clock. And when the clock strikes noon, I wanna turn on that flashlight for just an instant. 
And that light is gonna travel down that long hallway, reflect off the mirror and come back and it's gonna enter my eyes and I'm gonna see it. And when I see the reflection, I will immediately look at the clock and if, if I did this experiment, it would take two seconds for that to happen. We think of our reflection in a mirror as instantaneous, but it's not quite. It's delayed just a little bit. And if you had a hallway that long, it would take two seconds to see the reflection, amazingly. And we've done experiments like this. There's, there's a reflector on the moon, and it's a little further away than that. And sure enough, it takes, it takes the amount of time that we would expect. And, and, and what we do is you take the total distance, which is 186,000 miles times two, because it has to travel that distance twice, and we divide that by the two seconds, and that is your velocity. But that is an average velocity, meaning we've, it, we don't know that the light has always traveled at that speed. Hypothetically, it could be the case that the light took no time at all to zip out to the mirror and all of two seconds to come back. Right? I mean, that, I mean, as far as I know, I'm standing here where the, the flashlight is. For all I know, all, all I know is that the light took, takes two seconds to make the full trip. I don't know when it hit the mirror, right? It might have, it might have hit the mirror instantly and then taken, no, and taken all two seconds to get back. Or it might be the reverse. It might be that the light takes all of the two seconds to go out and hit the mirror and then no time at all to come back. He said, well, why, why, why would it be different? Is some, something magical about the mirror? No, I could have another flash. Uh, uh, my friend could stand over there with a flashlight. When he sees the beam, he could send another signal back. Either way, it's gonna take two seconds. The point is, I don't know what the speed of light is on a one-way trip. I only know the round-trip average. And that's what we, in fact, measure when we measure the speed of light. People say, but why would it be different? I don't know, but I don't know why. It would have to be the same either. Right? We can't just make arbitrary assumptions in science. We have to test them. And the interesting thing is if, if that bottom solution, if, if that's actually the nature of reality, if light, when it moves away from an observer, travels at, ha say, half C, and then when it travels toward the observer, it travels at instantly, it travels infinitely fast. If that's the case, then there's no distant starlight problem because the light doesn't have to go from Earth to the galaxies. It only has to go from the galaxies to the Earth. It's a one-way trip. And if it's instantaneous, that solves the starlight problem. And you say, yeah, but, but come on, Lyle, just wishing for that doesn't make it so, right? We wanna test it, we wanna see what the one-way speed of light actually is. Okay, how do we do that? How do we measure the speed of light on a one-way trip? You gotta have two clocks. You gotta have one clock to tell you know, when to start the experiment, so that you start it right at noon, and then you gotta have another clock to record the time when the light arrives. Straightforward, right? And so what we'll do is I'll stand here with my clock. I got another clock over there. It's got a de detector on it. It records the time when the light arrives and we'll measure the one-way speed that way. Well, I did this in my office and uh, I, I have a clock. I don't have a long hallway, but I have the clock on my phone and it's, you know, it's five feet away from my watch and I, I can convert. I'm pretty good at math, so I can do that. And when my clock, when my watch strikes noon, I turned on the flashlight, it, the light went and hit the phone. It looked like it was practically instantaneous, but when the light hit the phone, the phone read 12.05. And so, should we conclude? Well, logically, light took five minutes to get from my watch to the phone, right? Well, of course not. The reason, and, and, and that really happened, that's, exact, that's actually the result, is you know, when this, when this says noon, I shine the light, the phone says 12.05, I say light travels five feet, and it takes it five minutes to do that, so light travels one foot per minute. Well, that's not right. Obviously, the clock on the phone is ahead of the clock on my wrist. You see, this method only works if these clocks are synchronized, if they read the same time at the same time. Or you know about synchronized clocks. You've seen the spy movies. Let's all synchronize our watches, right? They, they make sure they read the same time at the same time. So here's my point. In order to do this kind of experiment, those two clocks have to be exactly synchronized. And I do mean exact, because if that clock is one second ahead or behind that one, it'll make the difference between the speed of light being one half C and infinity. It's a huge difference. And so it's not good enough for them to be approximately synchronized. They have to be exactly synchronized. You say, okay, no problem. We'll just make sure the clocks are synchronized. It turns out that's really hard to do when they're separated by a distance. When the clocks are together, no problem. Let's synchronize our watches, we can see they're synchronized. But the synchronized clocks separated by a distance, how do you do that? Normally the way we do it is by radio transmission. There is a uh, radio transmitter in Fort Collins, Colorado connected to the atomic clock in Boulder and it's sending out radio pulses and there are other clocks that are designed to detect that pulse and they set themselves to the right time. I've got a clock myself that does that, it receives that uh, pulse from uh, Colorado every 
evening and sets itself to midnight or, or, or noon, let's say noon in this case. But there's a problem with this. You say, okay, the clocks are synchronized now. Well, actually, radio, although radio is very fast, it actually, radio might take a little bit of time to get from that transmitter to that clock. And so actually, that clock might be just a little bit behind the clock on the radio transmitter. Do you see what I'm saying? It might be just a little bit behind it because the radio takes a little bit of time. Radio is a wave, and it takes a little bit of time to get there, even though it's very fast. So in, in order, well, if I knew the speed of radio, if I knew how long it took radio to make that trip, then I could, I could compensate, I could push the clock ahead a little bit, right? So how fast does radio travel? Anybody know? Speed of light. Isn't that interesting? But wait, wait a minute, that's the very thing I'm trying to measure. You see the problem? I'd have to already know the one-way speed of light, which is the same as the one-way speed of radio because they're the same substance, just different frequencies. I'd have to already know that in order to compensate and make sure the clocks are synchronized. That's the very thing I don't know. Uh, some people have thought putting the radio transmitter in between the two clocks, well, that'll work, right? Because then maybe they're both behind the transmitter, but they're at least the same as each other. But that assumes that the speed of light and therefore the speed of radio is the same in that direction as it is in that direction. Because if it isn't, then one cl clock gets set to noon first, and then another clock gets set to noon later. You see? So that's not gonna work. We can't, by radio transmission, synchronize two clocks exactly. You can do it approximately, but that's not good enough if we wanna measure the one-way speed of light. As a last resort, people have said, well, what we'll do is we'll synchronize the clocks when they're together, and then we'll move one of them or both of them to opposite ends of the hallway. That seems pretty reasonable, right? The assumption being that they're still synchronized. But there's a problem here, too. According to Einstein, motion affects the passage of time. The very act of moving the clock causes it to become desynchronized with the other clock. Isn't that interesting? Now, that's a, it's a minuscule effect, which is why you don't notice it in your everyday lives. But my point is, they have to be exactly synchronized or you're gonna get the wrong answer for the one-way speed of light. Now, the good news is there's an equation that tells us, Einstein derived it, how, how much time is affected by that motion. And so if we knew the velocity of the clock, we could put that in and we could say, okay, it's lost a second or it's gained a second, and we could, we could compensate for it. But the problem is, in that equation, is the speed of light. The very thing I don't know. Okay, so what's, <laughs> what's the point of all this? The point of all this is, is, is the following. Apparently, it's impossible to synchronize two clocks separated by a distance without already knowing the one-way speed of light in advance. And it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light without two syn synchronized clocks separated by distance. You see the problem? We're stuck in a permanent catch-22. Apologetics aside, I just think this is fascinating that God has designed the universe in such a way that you cannot measure the one-way speed of light. It can't be done. And by the way, if, if you're thinking, well, I, th I think I've found a solution. You haven't, because I gotta tell you, physicists have been trying to solve this for 100 years and nobody's come up with a solution. There have been some that have tried and then the next paper, it's refuted. And they say, well, you, you made an assumption here that's, that's not correct. Uh, it is apparently impossible to measure the one-way speed of light objectively without already assuming what it is. Isn't that fascinating? And so that, that's, that leaves us in a little bit of a quandary because I was kind of hoping that maybe the speed of light's instantaneous when it's moving toward me. But in fact, I now know that we can never know what the one-way speed of light is, interestingly. Uh, but here's the interesting thing, though. Whenever you have something like this that's circular, it's often suggestive that the thing you're trying to measure isn't really a property of nature at all. It's actually a convention. A convention is something we decide, we all agree to it, and it works, like driving on the right side of the road. We all agree to that, and it works. It works very well. If somebody disagrees in our culture and they try it the other way, it's not gonna work out well for them. However, other cultures, you go to Australia, they drive on the left side of the road. That works for them because they all agree to it. That's a convention. The one-way speed of light is a convention. That's what I'm gonna to suggest to you. It's not a property of nature. It's something we get to choose, and then that tells us how to synchronize clocks. And now that you've synchronized clocks, you can measure the one-way speed of light, and you'll find that it is whatever you chose it to be, as long as you're logically consistent. So you get the point? You can pick what you want the one-way speed of light to be within certain constraints. Now, the round-trip speed is set by God. You can't change that. The one-way speed, you get, to, you get to pick, and then that tells you how to synchronize clocks, and then when you measure the light speed with, with those clocks that you synchronized, you will get whatever answer you picked to begin with. That's the nature of a convention. And this, this principle is called the conventionality thesis. It's something that has been 
studied for, again, 100 years in physics. Einstein knew about this and wrote about it. Very fascinating. And so uh, I'm not going to go through all of this for time's sake, but Einstein was aware of the conventionality thesis and affirmed it. And so my point is I am free to define the one-way speed of light to be instantaneous toward the observer. And we'll call that the anisotropic synchrony convention. Anisotropic means different speeds in different directions. So the light, when it's moving toward me, is in, in, instantaneous. It doesn't take any time at all. But light in other directions takes longer. And I'm free to do that, and all the physics works out. John Winnie demonstrated that in the 1970s. He wrote a paper on uh, Einstein's relativity without one-way velocity assumptions. It's a brilliant paper. He demonstrated that all the physics works. Yes, GPS, GPS satellites will work, et cetera, et cetera. All these things work regardless of the one-way speed of light. You can pick what you want it to be. And I'm going to suggest that the Bible uses this convention, that the Bible uses a convention whereby when we see something, that's when it happened, because the light's instantaneous by that convention. It's not that the other convention's wrong, it's just different. And the neat thing about this is, if I'm right about that, then there's no distant starlight problem, because the light traveling from those galaxies toward observers on Earth is instantaneous. Isn't that interesting? And this is all consistent with known physics. That's the neat thing about this. It, may, it might sound weird to you, but I, I guarantee you, if you come up against somebody who knows something about the physics of Einstein, they'll, be, they'll probably be aware of this. And it's, it's certainly in the literature. But I want to suggest that the Bible does use this convention because, until modern times, everybody did. In the ancient world, they marked time by when they saw something happen. That, that was universal. It wasn't until, uh, in fact, they couldn't have done it any other way because they didn't know what the round trip speed of light was. They couldn't subtract it off. You saw something happen, that's when it happened. And that's, a very, that's very natural to our thinking, isn't it? You're, up, you're, you're watching me up here. It probably didn't occur to you to think, boy, I wonder how many millions of years ago Lyle was really up there. <laughs> you say, well, he's, I'm seeing him right now, right? That's when it happened. That's a very natural convention to use. And the Bible being written for all people at all times, and not just 21st century astrophysicists, uh, the Bible would use the natural convention that would be understood by, by people at all times. At least that's, that's what uh, I think is the case. And I think it's suggested in Genesis 1 as well. Genesis 1, 14 and 15, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the light. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And we find out, you know, it's the sun, the moon, the greater light, the lesser light, the stars also that were made at that time. And he says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. So one of the purposes of the stars is to give light on the earth. And it says, and it was so. What was so? He made the stars and they gave light on the earth. So I don't believe they took any time to give light on the earth. They, began, they gave light on the earth immediately. As soon as God spoke them into existence, they immediately began fulfilling their God-ordained role to give light on the earth. And that would be consistent with this ask or anisotropic synchrony convention. And I know that's a little counterintuitive. I know it's a little mind-blowing. I hope your brain's still in your, your head there. It's a I know it's a little weird, but who said physics had to be intuitive, right? You say, I don't like, I don't like some of this quantum mechanics stuff. Well, take it up with God, right? He, he designed the universe. We just discover aspects of it. So my point is we do have an answer to distant starlight. It's something that requires you to know a little bit about physics, but, um, and, and you can read more on this. I'll, I'll show you, point you to some resources where you can read more about it if you wanna know more about it. But I think we've seen that the glory of God is revealed in creation. The Bible's right about that. We've seen the Bible is right when it speaks to the basics of astronomy. We've seen the Bible is right when it addresses the age of the universe. We've seen the Bible is right when it addresses the uniqueness of Earth. And we've seen the Bible is right about distant starlight. Uh, regardless of whether or not my explanation is the correct one, we can have confidence that God does know how to keep time, and he knows how to communicate to us. And so the Bible got it right. That's the thing that I want you to, to, to take away. We have a number of resources on this topic. The book that covers most of what I covered this evening is called Taking Back Astronomy. And so we have that over uh, for sale over uh, in the lobby there. So Taking Back Astronomy, the universe declares God's glory, not a big bang or billions of years. If you wanted to learn how to find some of these wonderful objects that I showed you, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. We'll show you how to find those. There's, there's a lot of stuff you can see naked eye. You just gotta know where to look. A lot of stuff you can see in binoculars. And uh, you have star charts. It's, it's a wonderfully illustrated uh, book. And uh, again, if you wanna get a telescope, what kind you might wanna get. Telescopes are not that expensive. And they're, they're a great, it's a great hobby. Astronomy is, even if you don't go into it professionally like I did, it's just a lot of fun. It's, it's very enjoyable to see God's creation in a way that not too many people get to experience. The Physics of Einstein, if you wanna learn more about distant starlight and how all that works, I do have a book 
on that very topic. And it goes through in, in greater detail and kind of builds it up too. It gives you more of, a, more of the background that you need to know to understand these principles. It's written for laymen. I do have uh, boxes though that have more technical information like mathematical derivations and so on. But uh, you can skip the boxes if you want to. I won't tell anybody. Okay, so it's there for you if you want it. Created Cosmos takes you on a tour of the universe. That's the, that's the planetarium show that I wrote for the Creation Museum. It's really a little movie. It takes you through the universe. And uh, really neat, I'm very, I'm very uh, pleased with the way that that turned out. Understanding Genesis, the topic I covered this morning, how do we know that God really created in six days, and so on, that's gonna show you that textually we do know what God meant. And the relevance of Genesis is the presentation I gave this morning in the main service. Gave it a little different title, but that's it. Ultimate proof of creation, if you want a bulletproof argument for biblical creation. Now we covered this at the, uh, at the, uh, the men's conference, but if you didn't have a chance to attend, or if you wanted to follow up on that, that's the book you're gonna wanna get. And we have DVD, by the way, we have DVD on this topic as well, I just don't have a slide for it. But The Ultimate Proof of Creation, and uh, two follow-up DVDs, Nuclear Strength Apologetics, Volumes 1 and 2, it really show you how to apply this, this uh, method, it's very effective. Discerning Truth, How to Spot Logical Fallacies and Arguments that Evolutionists Make, that's a useful skill to know. Because critics of the Bible make all kinds of mistakes in reasoning, and a lot of times we let them get away with it because we don't recognize how to spot fallacies. It's very helpful to be able to politely say to the critic, well, you, you've made a mistake in your reasoning, that's the fallacy of reification or whatever, and you, and you identify that and help them, help them through it. Very effective, very helpful. Keeping faith in an age of reason answers 100, 420 alleged Bible contradictions and shows that not one of them is legitimate. Science confirms the Bible. What about genetics, fossils, things of that nature, geology? Uh, well, it's gonna show you that those confirm what the Bible teaches. Creation evangelism, how do I evangelize more effectively? How do I take this message out to folks? That's gonna show you how to do that. We have one on dinosaurs too. A lot of times kids really like dinosaurs and the secular world uses dinosaurs to mislead kids and help try to get them to believe in evolution. We can use the truth about dinosaurs to show them the Bible's true. The Bible does have something to say about that topic. Uh, this is my latest resource, Introduction to Logic. It's actually designed to be a curriculum. It gives you a complete introduction to the field of logic from a uniquely Christian perspective. It shows you how logic is rooted in the nature of God. And logic would not make sense apart from the Christian worldview. There's also a teacher's guide that goes with it if you'd like, and you can use that as a, uh, we kind of had a homeschool curriculum in mind, but you can use it just yourself if you want to get sharper on, on logic. You can get all of our DVDs together for a discount price. You can get all the books together, except the um, introduction to logic, that's separate. You can get all those together for a discounted price, or you can get everything together for a discounted price. And, lot, and you'll have an instant creation library, and a lot of people like to do that, and it saves you a little bit of money there as well. Uh, don't forget to sign up for our free, free, free monthly newsletter, and you'll get a, a message about uh, kind of mid-month. Every month we uh, release that, and just kind of, hopefully just kind of bless you a little bit and keep you informed on what we're doing in the ministry. And check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. If you want to uh, partner with us financially, we'd appreciate that. But if, if you can't do that, that's fine. It's a free website, and please enjoy our articles there. I hope you've enjoyed these presentations, and I want to thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you.